Dr. Combs. She is like, I've not corrected her on her pronunciation before. Anyway, hello. Let's crack on with some B identification. First of all, very important question to get out the way. What is a B? What is a B? Well, I think you're all at least vaguely familiar with what on earth a bee is. Bees are insects. They're very well known insects. They're probably some of the world's most loved insects. I don't have statistics to back that up. Perhaps we'll do a poll at the end. Um, but bees are insects and they belong to an order, a group of insects called the Hymenoptera. That's the same order, um, which also includes the wasps and the ants. That throws a lot of people when you first tell them that, but it's absolutely true. I'm not making it up. And if you look closely at some of them, you realize they are very similar shapes. All insects have uh, the same basic body plan. They have a head, they have a thorax in the middle there, which the legs and perhaps the wings in some insects are attached to. And then they have the abdomen down the back end. That's usually the biggest bit. Uh, and sure enough, the hymenoptera are no exception to that rule. Um, the hymenoptera are usually, they're, they're pinched in quite a bit. They've got quite a skinny little waist. Now you can't see that on some of the bigger, fluffier bumblebees. Uh, but on the skinnier bees, you can. And it, it, if you look closely, they're the same sort of shape as an ant and indeed a wasp. So uh, there's your proof, if you just believe me. Now, the Hymenoptera have got loads and loads of examples within the order of social species. Now, not all social, but they are generally very social insects, particularly the, the, the members of the Hymenoptera that you guys will already know about. You think about ants. Most of those live in large groups, as you'll, be, as you'll already be aware. Uh, the bumblebees, the honeybees famously live in large groups, many wasps and hornets and other uh, members of that group do as well. So there are, there are some wonderful examples of social insects and what societies they build. We'll talk a little bit about that. I've already mentioned that they're all similar shapes. Now the bees, that's what we're here to talk about tonight, have four wings. I know if you look at some cartoons it might appear that they've only got two, it's not true. They've got four wings, um, which they do tend to move largely simultaneously, but they have they have four wings. Um, most wasps also have four wings and some ants do. I know everybody complains about flying ants when they turn up towards the end of the summer, um, but you can, uh, you can read all about that when that comes. So where do the bees come from? This is an important question um, and one that I don't think many people talk about, but bees have been around for a long, 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 long time. They've emerged around 100 million years ago in the late Cretaceous period. That's in the Mesozoic era, era which for those of you who aren't aware, is when the dinosaurs were around. They, were, um, they emerged alongside dinosaurs. That's pretty impressive. They were the first creatures on the planet to enjoy these lovely little things called bees. And wonderfully, these bees happen to coincide with the evolution of this newfangled technology called flowering plants, flowers. We're quite familiar with them nowadays. They were brand new when the bees were new. They were all released together. Um, and in the 100 million years that have passed since, the two groups have co-evolved beautifully. They have evolved to suit one another and to, to work out this very, very complex, but now quite well-known relationship. And in essence, it works in that the bees want to, uh, the plants want bees or any insects, they're not too fussy, to visit one flower inadvertently or intentionally, pick up some pollen and pass it and then drop it off on another flower that they then move to. So you've got to get a means of attracting the bees in there. Now, some bees will eat the pollen, they will use that itself. But for bee, some bees and, and for other insects too, the plants produce something called nectar. You've all heard of nectar, a lovely sweet sugary liquid, which is their little, uh, their little payment for the bees to come in. So both groups, both the plants and the bees are benefiting from this relationship. And it's a classic, classic example of something called a mutualism. And you've seen, well, you, well, you will be aware perhaps um, of some of the wonderful, sometimes very specific relationships that plants now have evolved with insects and both have co-evolved as we call it over that hundred million years um, to to maximize the efficiency and the benefits each one receives from that relationship they aren't really really good at this pollination malarkey um, they're very well adapted to collecting pollen most bees are generalists they're not that fussy as to which plants uh, they go for uh, which is which is a good way to be that that's pretty useful because you can never guarantee you're, you're never too worried then uh, if a particular species is in decline. Um, so generalist is, 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 being a generalist is quite, quite a useful strategy. Um, they've got some wonderful, wonderful methods of acquiring the pollen from flowers, including this one that I mentioned here, buzz pollination, which does what it says on the tin. They stand in the flower and they buzz. They buzz the pollen off of the flower onto them um, and they will collect it and gather it in pollen baskets. I say pollen baskets. I just, 
I just patted my leg to accentuate that point um, because they keep them amongst the hairs on their legs. So if you see bees buzzing around with bright yellow or orange legs, that's because they've got their pollen baskets lovely and full. They've had a good successful shopping trip. Now in Britain, as I mentioned earlier on, we've got quite a few bees. We've got just over 260. Um, I don't like to put a specific figure on species numbers at all, purely because, uh, well, for a number of reasons, really. Species are discovered, species are reclassified, they're divided up, amalgamated, um, some of them go extinct. So a specific number on species is, uh, is never too, uh, you know, never, never give it too much weight, but over 260 species in the UK, um, which is why we're not covering them all tonight, um, all face very serious threats, as do so many species of our wildlife, not just bees, not just insects, um, so many of our species. And very interestingly, perhaps, um, so many of the drivers of bee decline are also the same drivers of the decline of many, many other species and populations too. So all of our bees face serious threats, 35 of them are near extinction. Now within Britain, our bees can be divided really into two categories. We've got the social bees, that we talked about earlier on. I said how social many, many, many members of the Hymenoptera are and can be. So we've got the social bees, like I said, your, your bumblebees and your honeybees, but a very significant proportion of our bees in Britain are actually solitary bees. It's not to say they're antisocial, but they don't live in fast, big groups. And that accounts for 90% of the bee species in the UK. They're not the ones you see in the cartoons. They're not the ones people talk about, but most of our bees are solitary. Now, what are the benefits of bees? Well, I don't need to talk too long and deep about this because you guys will be familiar with the benefits of bees. I think we've all long been aware since primary school, we've all been told about some of the benefits that bees bring. Bees and many other pollinated insects are responsible for much of the food we eat. Over two thirds of the world's crop species rely on pollinators uh, to, 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 uh, to function, to, to, to produce anything. Lots of fruits. Um, some classic examples there, apples, bananas, oranges, strawberries, tomatoes, all pollinated by bees, vegetables like carrots, potatoes, cabbage, broccoli. All of these mainstays, these staples of our diet for centuries, um, we rely on bees for them. One that always throws people, and it's perhaps not obvious immediately, is that animal products rely on bees. The meat, the eggs and the dairy. I'm not saying you milk a bee, but the fact is that the hard feed that those, those livestock are fed on through the winter is usually comprised of crops which rely on pollination. So without the bees, you won't have your, uh, your bacon and eggs either, if your fruit doesn't interest you. Something that does interest a lot of people, tea and coffee. I think most people gasp for a coffee first thing on the morning, forget it if you haven't got the bees. Same thing goes for chocolate, tell your children that, no chocolate. Honey, well, that's an obvious one. Without honey bees, you won't be having any honey. And the most important one for those of you particularly down here in the West Country, no cider. Now that, I can see the panicked faces in some of those cameras. Don't worry, don't worry. We're going to do what we can to help the bees. But I just feel the need to point that out so you are aware of what's at stake. So what are the threats to bees? Because clearly we need to sort it. Um, well, like I said, many of the drivers of bee decline are common to many groups of species. Chief among them, perhaps, is the loss of habitat and the fragmentation of that habitat that remains. That's largely down in Britain to the changes in our farming methods. We, many of our farms and our whole farming landscape has changed drastically uh, in the last half a century. Really, really drastically. We've got larger fields, we've got fewer hedgerows because we've got bigger machines working in those fields. You can't turn them around if you've got tight fields. So they've ripped out hedgerows, got big, large monoculture fields um, sprayed with all sorts of things because we have a growing population and we have to feed them efficiently. But that has been to the detriment of so many species. 97%, you can see there, of our traditional wildflower meadows have been lost since World War II. Now, a wildflower meadow you will hear a lot about nowadays in magazines and in social media. It's not a natural habitat. A wildflower meadow um, is a byproduct of a, our traditional, from years ago, from yesteryear, it's a nice word, yesteryear, our farming methods from light grazing and from one, maybe two hay cuts every year. Nowadays, when we take several cuts for silage uh, throughout the year, we, no, nothing gets a chance to flower, but, but years ago we didn't, we didn't take anywhere near as much out of our fields. So we had fields buzzing full of beautiful wildflower varieties, which nowadays you're lucky to find in a garden centre. 
Instead, there are all sorts of domestic cultivars from all over the world. But our wildflowers in Britain are beautiful and they are vast and varied, but they're so rare now. They're, like I said, 97% of our traditional wildflower meadows are gone. That's quite staggering. Now, at face value, you'll all, you'll all be able to see straight away the impact that that has. Fewer flowers means there's less food for bees. Straight away, none of that nectar. Um, but there's so much else to it as well. It's not just about the flowers. Longer vegetation, denser vegetation generally, uh, benefits all sorts of species. Butterflies are another great example. We all know butterflies like to feed on flowers. The caterpillars don't. They feed on grasses and nettles and thistles and things like that. All of these plants which are now sprayed or pulled out or binned or burned or whatever. Having this tidier landscape, getting rid of all of this dense vegetation and having short mown lawns and, and tidy verges, cut back hedges, means that there are fewer places for these species to nest, for their larvae to feed. We've lost so much because of our obsession with tidiness in this case. Yes, the changes in farming practices was a big driver, but our ongoing obsession with tidiness is definitely an issue. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. There's another promise for later on. Roads, well, roads break up habitats. Yes, they do. So those remaining habitats are now divided. And we all know the impacts potentially of roads on lots of species, on, on our larger fauna, on our vertebrates, our mammals and our birds, lots of them get killed on roads. Uh, but they also act as a great big divide for insects like bees, uh, which are quite tricky to cross without getting pulled away in a lorry's tailwind or hit on the, on the windscreen as you go across. But roads could be, could be a real asset if we treated our road network effectively. Our road network at the end of the, uh, network at the, end of the day was designed to connect up the country. So how about we use it to connect up habitats if we treat those roadside verges as best we could? Just an idea, just an idea. And I'm sure I'm not the first one to suggest that to you guys. Other threats, obviously, as I mentioned before, include pesticides. That's linked to the intensification of farming. Um, I've already mentioned that. And pesticides don't only wipe out the insects and other invertebrates directly, but that obviously has a, a bottom up, a trophic cascade um, through the food chain. So many species like hedgehogs, um, like many of our birds as well, our farmland birds, have suffered because of the lack of insects because they've all been sprayed with an inch their life. I mean, that's not just farmland either. I am, I'll be honest, I'm sick to death of walking into supermarkets or indeed any shop nowadays and seeing shelf after shelf after shelf of kill this, kill that, kill this, kill the moths, kill the ants, kill the bees, kill him. You know, it's, it's absurd, it's unnecessary and it's devastating. It really is devastating. Climate change is another big thing. It's a really big factor that we hear an awful lot about. And most of what we hear about is how it's going to impact us. And believe me, it will. But that's not the talk we're tonight. But the thing is, it's going to impact every species on the planet. Every species must respond to changes in their environment. With bees, it impacts their behaviour. Um, but a really key thing, with, as far as the bees are concerned, and many other species too, is that it alters their phenology. Now, if you've not heard the word phenology before, phenology is basically nature's calendar. Uh, things there are certain events in nature like the emergence of certain flowers in the spring the emergence of the bees too um which to coincide with those flowers so they can feed on them feed up and start a colony going that year all of these things are triggered some by day length by the change in day length they go on springtime now we better get going but many of them are triggered by changes in temperature with it when a climate change changes that temperature all of that gets thrown out of whack and if flowers emerge at a different time to the bees and the bees miss the flowers disaster. Those bees don't get to feed, they don't get to produce that colony, and those, their population drops like a stone. The plants, they miss the bees, so they don't get pollinated, their population drops like a stone, and the whole thing falls apart. Over 100 million years at least, these, these uh, species have been co-evolving, and they've been synchronizing their calendars, and if climate change throws their calendars out the window, we're going to see some real drastic change. We're starting to see it already in, uh, in things like some of the blue tits, which rely on uh, the emergence of caterpillars to coincide with when they breed. If they don't, then they see a vast drop in their population. That's a talk for another night. So how can we help? I know that's quite, that was, that was almost a rant and I'm sorry. It's a lot of sad things. Um, there are a lot of worrying things. Like I said, think of the cider. Um, but how can we help? Well, first and foremost, the obvious one, we can provide more flowers to feed the bees. Leave parts of your garden untidy, leave parts of any ant land you own untidy. It doesn't all need to be mown within an inch of its life. I'm telling you, take it from me. Avoid using chemicals. We've explained why and where you can buy organic. That's the same thing. That's, that's touching on the same thing there. 
So we've talked a little bit about the background of bees. We've talked a little bit about what's happening with the bees, what decline they're suffering and why, and what we can do to help. Now, there are plenty of projects going on, as I'm sure you'll probably already be aware, that are helping bees already. You may well have heard of bee lines. Now that B in this case doesn't actually stand for the bees we're talking about tonight. That stands for biodiversity, because this is not just about the bees. Bug life have been behind the bee lines project. And the idea is to, similar to that road network idea that we talked about earlier on, to connect up habitats across the country by, by um, reinstating, restoring, uh, or indeed installing, instating in the first place, habitats and a network thereof across the country so that these populations can be connected up and that genetic connection, that genetic diversity is really important, important for their resilience as well. It allows these, uh, these populations to move across the landscape freely through this network of, um, of habitats. So that's a little bit, bit, bit about bee lines. You can read about that on their website. That's just a section, a little screenshot there of the bee lines for our area, for our part of Somerset, um, just there. Then there's the rewilding in North Somerset. Now, as I mentioned earlier on, that's what I've been working on. So North Somerset Council have made a very good decision by all accounts to alter the management of 25%, just a quarter, of their amenity grassland. Now amenity grassland is your parks, public spaces, roadside verges, that sort of thing, um, which I'm sure you're all very used to seeing as nice, neat, short mown pieces of grass here and there. Well, when there are playing fields and parks and things like that, then yeah, that's how, that's how we need to keep it because people need to use those spaces. And where we're talking about a, a corner on a roadside where drivers need to see around, we ought to keep that short for safety. But you'll, find if you look properly that there are so many spaces where you don't need to be doing that at all so north somerset council said let's not then and they've moved from cutting every two or three weeks to cutting once a year at the end of the summer like those old traditional hay cuts letting plants grow up flower and set seed in some places they've planted trees as well and what a difference it makes the taller vegetation provides shelter and food for so many species the flowers obviously that's an obvious one too avon wildlife trust that's us we got involved because we are helping to monitor the changes in biodiversity as a result of those changes in management. It's funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund and a big part of this project is about involving the local community. And you guessed it, that's why I'm here. That's why I'm talking to you guys because a big part of that is telling you about what's happening, what's, about, what's happening with the bees, telling you which bees which, and then inviting you to come out and, uh, and help us out, have a little look at what bees are around in your local area. We'll talk a little bit more about that right at the end. But for now, I think, and I've bored you all enough, and you're going, come on, where's the bees? Where's the bees? Where's the bees? Here's the bees. We're going to talk about identifying bees. Buckle up, sit comfortably. Oh, my back just clicked. I'm 27. It shouldn't be clicking like that. Anyway, let's crack on. As I said earlier on, we divide the bees. We categorise the bees into social bees and solitary bees. So nice nice uh, clear categorization largely the social bees contain the bumblebees everybody knows the bumblebees and the classic honeybee in the uk we've got 24 bumblebees they're the big fluffy ones you'll all be familiar with the bumblebees i'm sure you'll see them buzzing around you'll have seen them around already now we've got 24 species don't worry we're not focusing on uh, we're not going to look at all of them tonight we're just going to focus on some of the most common ones that you'll be seeing around and about right now now, what makes it a little bit more difficult when you're IDing bumblebees is that because they're social, these social structures have several different roles in them. You'll probably be at least vaguely familiar with this idea that you have a queen bee, you have other females too, and, you, and worker bees, and you have the male bees as well, which are produced later in the year to, to reproduce and produce the next generation of queens for the following year. That'd be really handy if they all look the same within the same species, but I'm very sorry, they don't. Um, that does get confusing, and I would be here all night if I sat with you and went through every variation and every difference. That comes from time in the field and getting used to it. But what we're going to do is talk at least about what the queens look like, which at the moment, in early spring, the queens are, are out and about and buzzing around. So that's what you should be seeing. You might start to see some of the workers, uh, so it might get a little bit confusing, but, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll cover that if need be. So as I said, the queens are emerging about now, or rather they, they emerged a few weeks back. The queens emerged after the winter. They've been, they've been sheltering, hiding in those untidy areas um, and they will emerge and their first job is to feed up on those, on those first early wildflowers, primroses, 
um, daffodils, all of those things that emerge quite early on. The bees go, brilliant, that's what I need. I'm glad they're here because I'm starving. It's been a long, long winter. The queen will then, once she's fed up, she wants to try and find a hole in the ground, an old mammal burrow perhaps, and she'll go in there and she'll start to produce this year's colony. She'll start by producing a few females, a few workers. They will tend the young and start to produce the next lot and they will tend and look after the nests. Later on in the year, the males come out and then they mate with the new females. And those new females, the ones they mate with, are the prospective queens for next year. Once the uh, summer is over, those, uh, the queen that we talked about that started this whole thing off, she dies and so do the males. But those protective queens, the prospective queens, sorry, who have been mated by those males, they go and find somewhere to hide. They shelter through the winter and the next spring they emerge and start the whole thing again. That's basically a bumblebee's year. So right now we've got the queens emerging and they've started to produce those colonies. That's the point we're at at the moment. So let's talk about bumblebees. This is the buff-tailed bumblebee, Bombus terrestris. So many bees you'll have seen in the cartoons are classically black and yellow, stripes all the way down them. But if we actually look closely, we can break that down a little bit and it can help us to ID what we're actually looking at. So in this case, you can see we've got one stripe, yes, behind the head on the front of that thorax there. I've got another stripe on the front of the abdomen, behind the wings. Now these stripes on the buff-tailed bumblebee they're not quite bright yellow. Here's a buttercup for contrast. It was very considerate of this bee uh, to sit next to that one. Um, they're more orangey on the buff tailed bumblebee. They're more orange stripes, which is quite useful. And the tail is off white. It might not be very clear in this photograph, but when we see some of the other bees, you'll see what I mean. That's a, it's a buff colored. It's, it's, a, it's a buff tailed bumblebee. It's a buff colored. And sure enough, they're, uh, they're an off white color. Now these guys have got quite short tongues. So they like open flowers, like buttercups as in the picture here. Um, they're also very fond of dandelions. Dandelions are much blind plants, but brilliant. Really, really brilliant plants for the bees, especially when they first emerge in the spring and they are hungry. So that's the buff-tailed bumblebee. Rather confusingly, it's a buff-tail is a fine example of how the workers do look a little bit confusing because the buff the buff-tailed bumblebee, the queen looks like this. She's got a buff-colored tail. When the workers and the males emerge later on in the year, they've got white bums, much clearer white. And that's a shame because the next species we're looking at is the white tailed bumblebee. So that doesn't help things, does it? Granted, they are a little bit smaller than the queen of the white tailed bumblebee. So we'll focus on the queens for today. Now, once again, we've got two stripes. We've got one behind the head. We've got one behind the wings on the front of that abdomen. But I think you might notice straight away that these aren't orange stripes. Those are definitely yellow. They are paler. They are definitely a nice bright yellow. This one is one of the males in the in the white tailed bumblebees. They've all got white tails. Size is the only real difference. Um, other than the fact that, as it says here, the males have a yellow face. So we can see this one's a male. Now, granted, when you're out in a boat, unless you get a decent look at them, you might not be able to see that. Don't worry. Don't worry if you can't. But uh, but we're, we're hoping to give you some idea of how you might be able to narrow it down. The tail, as the name suggests, is white. I'm just going to have a drink of water before I lose my voice and I'm going to turn my light on. Look at that. I'm coming to you live tonight. I should have mentioned from my caravan down here in Somerset um, on my driveway. So uh, it's proper, proper post studio we're in today. Anyway, carrying on. So look at the buff tail. There's those orange stripes with the buff colored tail. We've looked at the white tail with the much brighter yellow stripes on that white tail. Now here's the early bumblebee. Now the early bumblebee they are still around, but they're starting to tail off now because these guys, as it, the name suggests, come out early. They're out from March onwards up to June. So they're starting to tail off. But I saw one. I did see one today. I did see one today. Now these, the first thing that alludes you to the fact that it's an early bumblebee is they're significantly smaller than the other bumblebees. They are really little, little chaps and they're very, very sweet. Now we've got a yellow band on the thorax here, just the same as before. Uh, and, a, and one on the abdomen too. And if you can squeeze, if you can squint and just about make out the tail on this bee in the picture, that's orange. We've got a little orange bum on the early bumblebee. As I said earlier on, they're very early to emerge. And these guys will be making the most of those early flowering species, like your primrose, uh, your cowslips, your uh, daffodils, things that I mentioned earlier on, snowdrops as well. So those your, that's your early bumblebee right there, Bombus pretorum. So we've done the buff tail, we've done the white tail, we've done the early bumblebee. This one's an easy one. 
This one's pretty straightforward. Very much does what it says on the tin. And I like bumblebees because they're largely quite straightforward names. Um, you don't find that with the butterflies as much. You certainly don't find it with the moths. But let's not talk about moths tonight. So as the name suggests, we've got a very, very distinctive red tail on the red, uh, red tailed bumblebee. The females are all black other than that red tail. Um, so you've got the red tail there, but she would be all jet black. And they're very, very handsome, very striking. The, the red tailed bumblebee queens are quite big. Uh, you'll hear them at, at quite a distance. Um, but the males, like this one, has a yellow face, a bit of yellow fluff around his front end, so we know this one's a boy. Red tailed bumblebee, I won't spend too long on because I think that was pretty straightforward. It's, it's got a red tail. And our last bumblebee for tonight, who looks quite distinct from the rest, we've thrown out the yellow and black stripes, we've gone forget that. This is what Bumblebee Conservation, uh, a different charity, this is what they call one of three all ginger bumblebees. And it's a good description. They really are very bright, and very ginger. Uh, and it, I mean, they're, they're lovely. I see quite a bit of these, quite a few of these are, are around and about on some of our wilding patches across North Somerset. And they are lovely. As I put there, they're fluffy and orange brown in colour. You can see from the picture. That's exactly what they look like. They're all ginger. Um, you can maybe make out some black bands on the abdomen. That's usually just dictated by the way the hairs lie. So how clear that will be when you get a glimpse of one will vary. Their, uh, their abdomen is, is a little bit squat. If you, if you ever get to see one, or if you look at an ID guide, you'll see they're a little bit squat in the abdomen. Um, but don't rely on that too much for your ID. Really, it's the fact that it's a, it's a big ginger fluffy thing. Um, it's probably a common cardiby, Bombus pascorum. Uh, these guys, as it says, they're on the wing from March all the way through to November. So they're out and about now. I saw some today. They're a nice, easy one to ID. You can spot these ones at a distance because that ginger, that ginger fluff does stand out more than the black and yellow stripes perhaps, or at least stands out and differentiates them nice and easily. So we've done five bumblebees there. Now that might not seem like a lot, but let me tell you, it takes a while to get your eye in between them. So when you're out and about nowadays, you'll be able to have a look and see if you can tell the difference. Is it buff-tailed, white-tailed? Is it an early bumblebee? Is it a red-tailed bumblebee? Is it maybe a common car to be? Other bumblebees are available. There are tree bumblebees, garden bumblebees, we could be here all day going through all 24. So I've given you the five main ones, which I think you're likely to see out and about. Design may vary. This is something I pointed out earlier on, and it's really important. Here is an indication of the species I said is the best example of that, perhaps. So here's the buff tail bumblebee, Bombus terrestris. The queen here, there's her buff tail. Very, very distinctive. But the workers and the males, that's white. Maybe a little buff fringe, but generally white. So, a little bit trickier to ID on that one, a little bit harder perhaps, but if you're just looking at queens then that's, that's a little bit easier. Now let's move beyond the bumblebees, let's go, let's go into the unknown, it's not unknown or if it is, it's about to be known, forget that. The honeybee, let's go with the honeybee. Now everybody is aware of the honeybee, I think we all hear about the honeybees and they're quite familiar, they're much smaller and sleeker and slimmer as I put there than the bumblebees, don't tell the bumblebees I said that. Um, and they've got quite a familiar black and gold barring. It's not a bright yellow at all. It's very much a gold, uh, sort of orangey amber color. Very nice looking bee, really. Um, how dark their abdomen appears varies between individuals. Um, and you can see here, this one's quite dark, but there's definitely a, a layer of hairs over it. And depending on how long though and thick those hairs are, how dense the hairs are, the, the, uh, the appearance of the abdomen can vary. Sometimes it looks like it's quite striped um, as the hairs are led down in a certain way. Um, otherwise, you can uh, some of them look quite dark on the abdomen. Now, I put there, there are very few wild colonies in the UK. I've never come across one. Um, most honeybees in the UK, almost all of them, in fact, if you encounter a honeybee, will have come from somebody's domestic hive. Indeed, there is a rather large question mark over whether or not the honeybee is native to the UK at all. Um, most of the ones that you see will be domestic bees and they will be hybrids of all sorts of things, you know, like any domestic domestic uh, animal is nowadays. They've been crossbred and, and hybridized to produce uh, the best crops of honey in this case. So the honeybee is an interesting one. There are very few, if any, wild colonies around in the UK. If you're lucky enough to find one, give me a ring, I wanna see it. Um, but generally these guys are domestic uh, animals, which is quite interesting. And it does lead me on to an interesting point that I often stop and make about now. Um, and nobody shot me for it yet, which is good. Um, but you see a lot of businesses nowadays, an awful lot of people buying hives of, uh, of honeybees and say, look, we're doing our bit for the environment. We've got loads of bees in. 
And if you stop and think about that for a second, it's not actually very helpful. Because it's not that we've got a lack of bees, it's the lack of bees is as a result of the lack of pollen, it's the result of the lack of habitat. So don't bring in 20,000 more mouths to feed, for goodness sake. We need to be restoring habitat. I don't want to hear we've got, we've got beehives on our farm, I want to hear we've got wildflowers on our farm. That's the way to do it. And then if you want to have some honey bees and get the honey from them, by all means, carry on. But it's not the solution. Bringing in more bees is not the answer by any stretch. Now let's move on from the social bees. Let's talk about the solitary bees. As I said, they're not completely antisocial, but they don't live in big groups. They don't have colonies. They don't have a queen. Um, they live quite differently to those social species we just talked about then. Now, of the solitary bees, which make up about 90% of all the bees we have in the UK, around 70% of those are mining bees. Now, we're not talking hi-ho, hi-ho. We're not talking tin and coal. We're talking little burrows in the ground. Um, very often, not necessarily dug by them. And they don't do too much of the mining, but they live in these burrows and they nest in these underground burrows. And that's, that's the key thing here. That's where they get the name from, mining bees. They don't carry a lamp or a canary. They don't use wax in these nesting cavities, um, or if they do very little, um, they use lots of other different materials. And we'll talk about some of the cool things they use to make their nesting cavities as we go on through some of the solitary bees tonight. Now these guys are particularly excellent pollinators, but <laughs> it's not what they're trying to do. It's, uh, it's, it's very much an accident on their part. For example, the red mason bee here, its pollination effort is the equivalent of about 120 honeybees, and that's for the simple reason that he's not as good at getting it home. So he picks up a load of pollen, and he just happens to drop more of it as he goes from plant to plant, which was brilliant from the flower's perspective, not so good from the bees. Um, but that's okay. That's all right. These guys are okay with that. They manage. Um, so from a, from a wildflower perspective, these solitary bees aren't great. Get the messy ones in. They've got shorter hairs, essentially, on their legs, which means they can't store as much pollen on there, and they drop most of what they do. That's why we've got bags for life nowadays. They're more reliable. That was a tenuous analogy, I grant you. I won't bother again. So let's talk about some of the mining bees. This is the early mining bee. Straight away, you can see that he's got pollen all over his legs. Ignore that. Don't necessarily be looking for that in the wild. The bright yellow leg would be a lovely ID feature. You can't guarantee it because you know he's going to drop half of it on the way home. The key thing with the early mining bee is, well, A, it comes out quite early. It's out from March. Uh, one of the first mining bee species you'll see. It's got bright ginger hairs on the thorax, a little bit like, a little bit like the common corridor bee, but I think you'll agree with me, it looks completely different. It's not a big fluffy thing, it's a sleeker bee. Most of the mining bees are, and they've got to get down a tight little hole. They can't be big and fluffy. That'd be an accident waiting to happen. I used to work in wildlife rescue. We never got a call out for a bee, but these would be responsible for it, I'm sure, if they were big and fluffy. So this gingery brown thorax is quite distinctive, um, and the abdomen is very, very dark. Now this photograph, and I've tried to find a better one, we've got a huge photograph library at the Wildlife Trust. It spans the country, all of our wildlife trusts across the UK. And I cannot find a better picture of an early mining bee. If anybody's got one, please email it to me. I would love to see it. Because what I would like to point out to you in this photograph is that it's got a little red tail, very much a red tip on the end. If you squint, maybe you can make it out. It doesn't work, I just tried it. But there is, believe me, there's a little red tip to the, to the abdomen there. But otherwise, it's a black abdomen uh, and a brown thorax. Now these guys, as I said earlier, they're one of the early emerging species. So they're after those early flowers, dandelion, hawthorn, willow. Um, hawthorn's not that early, I grant you, but hawthorn's out now in flower. Um, so these guys will be looking for those um, and they'll be all over them. So keep an eye out for the little early mining bees. This one is called Chris. It's the first time I've made that joke tonight. Um, I'm amazed it's taken me this long. The ashy mining bee. Now, I like the ashy mining bee because the ashy mining bee looked at the cartoons of the yellow and black bees and he was going through his, maybe his teenage phase and went, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing yellow and black, mum. I'm going grey and black. I'm going to be different. And fair play to him. Fair play to him. He is very much the hipster of the mining bee world. He's gone for grey stripes instead of yellow and I admire him for it. I think they're very stylish. I think they're very debonair. What a lovely little chap he is. And when you get to see one of these, you tell him that from me. So the two grey bands on the back of this one, and they're in the same place as those larger bumblebees, um, though perhaps that's not as clear because these guys are longer bees. Um, but once again, we've got a stripe behind the head on the front of that thorax and a stripe behind the wings on the front of the abdomen. But this time, as I said, they're grey. There's also another species that looks quite similar called a mourning bee. 
Um, but uh, the Ashy Mining Beat is generally what I see out and about. Now, these guys, another reason to, to appreciate the Ashy Mining Beat is I think, I think we can all relate to this. At the end of the day, when they finish foraging, they close up their little nest holes, they shut the world out, and they watch Netflix for four hours. I don't know if they about that bit, but still, they, uh, they, will close, they will close the door when they're, when they're tired, they're done for the day, or even when they're disturbed. And I think, again, like a moody teenager, we understand that. These guys are on the wing from April through to early August. So they're on the wing now. As I said, I've seen them out in the boat. Um, often you might see them like they're in this photograph there, um, looking around on bare earth for those burrows to, to nest in. Um, one of our sites, one of our wilding sites in North Somerset is in Porter's Head. And it's an old golf course, which is fantastic because that means there's bunkers there, old bunkers, which still, though they've grown in with lots of wonderful plant species now, um, all sorts of fancy things growing in there. It's wonderful to see. Much better used for it than a golf course, if you ask me. Um, but there's still quite a bit of bare soil. And so we find quite a lot of the mining bees in and amongst there. But that bare soil is there. It's, it gets warm. It's exposed. It's nice and warm for them. Um, and it cracks in the, in the heat. So it makes lots of little burrows they can, they can crawl into. This is the red mason bee. Now, once again, it's a ready ginger one. But it's not a bumblebee, so it's not big and fluffy like the common carder bee. It's got quite dense hairs and they're much shorter than that common carder bee we talked about earlier on. They're on the wing from late March, so they're on the wing right now. And their name, very interestingly, comes from a tendency to nest in old buildings that are falling apart. Uh, so that perhaps is another little nod to the need for a little bit of untidiness. I'm not advocating that we leave old buildings standing if they're a danger or anything like that. But traditionally, um, when perhaps health and safety was less, less hot on things, then years and years ago, over the, over the decades, over the centuries even, these guys have been making the most of our crumbling walls here and there. And that's where they get the name from. But as you can see, they are quite ready brown in colour, the red mason bee. This is the one we mentioned earlier on, who, is, uh, who can pollinate the equivalent of 120 honeybees. That's not bad going at all. Now, this next one, I think is the last one we're going to talk about tonight because otherwise you're going to be filling too much paper and your heads are going to be full of bees. And it's one of my favourites. Now this, I promised you, I told you, we'd talk about the cool ways that these solitary bees, these mining bees, build their nesting cavities. And the leaf cutter bee does what it says on the tin, like so many of them do. You'll never guess what these guys do. They cut leaves, they cut leaves and they use those sections to line their nest holes. They will um, find, uh, a hole, I've got them in my garden, in fact, in old brick holes drilled in the brick for many, many years ago. Um, and when I first discovered them in my garden, I was sat back back in the first lockdown in 1983. Um, and I could see something big and green flying through my garden down in, down the end. And I went to see it. I thought, on earth's that? And it wasn't something big and green that was on the wing. It was a big piece of leaf that was being carried by one of these bees. And that's often how you spot them. And what they do, as I said, they'll climb into a burrow, a hole like that. And first of all, they'll wallpaper it. They'll line the walls with it. I'm no good at wallpapering, but these guys are great at it. So they, they will line the walls of their burrow with these leaf sections. Um, and then they'll lay an egg in there, just the one egg in each section, in each chamber. They'll leave a little bit of little pile then of pollen and nectar, like a little breakfast in bed, little treat before they go out to work. Go, there you are. I didn't forget you. I've had a coffee. Here's some crumpets. Um, so uh, then what they'll do once they've left the breakfast for the, for the young when they wake up, they'll then seal the door with another piece of leaf. They love the leaf. Um, they put another little piece of leaf there and they'll leave them to it. Now those larvae will hatch out. They'll go, brilliant, mum's left me some breakfast, fab. Eat that up. And they'll spend the rest of the year in that burrow. They'll pupate in there um, through the autumn. Uh, they'll hibernate over the winter and they'll emerge the following year. So I've been keeping an eye on the holes in my wall actually to see if I get to see any emerge because I've seen them going in there nesting. I haven't seen any come out yet, but maybe I missed them. Some of us got to go to work. And those guys haven't. Anyway, so uh, the leaf cutter bee are a great little bee. If you don't get to see them carrying a leaf, though, this species, the patchwork leaf cutter bee, is quite distinctive because we've got this lovely bright orange underside. But if you do get to see them carrying a leaf, that's your question is answered. The trees, the species that they like to cut leaves from, are usually um, members of the rose family. So that's roses, obviously, apples, things like that. Um, they'll also take bramble, I'm, told, I'm uh, led to believe. So. Keep an eye out 
on your roses, if you've got little notches cut out of your leaves like this, you may well have leaf cutter piece. And it's very satisfying to watch if you ever get to see it. So let's take a breather. And then I'm gonna run through, I know it says let's try a few out, don't panic, it's not a quiz, nobody's being marked. We're just gonna go through, I think three images and see if we can ID them. So just have a breather, relax your, relax your fingers because you've been scribbling down all the, all the notes. I know you have, I know you have, it's, it's hard going, it's hard going. I'm gonna have a sip of water. It's hard talking this much. Now, let's have a look then, shall we? Now, classic, classic Zoom quiz criteria here. Don't put your answers in the chat. Don't shout out. Um, just maybe think to yourself. Have a think to yourself, and we'll uh, we'll see if you're right. You can give yourself a pat on the back. What's this one? Now this. Let's talk it through. This is Chris. He's. I'm not doing that joke again. This is Chris. He's a, he's a, he's a small bee. He's not a bumblebee. We can see that straight away. He's not big and he's not fluffy. He's got a bit of striping here, um, and as I said, some of them do. Sometimes they do but he's that beautiful golden brown color, he's quite sleek. This is Apis Melliflora, this is the honeybee. A nice little honeybee there. What about this one? Nice and straightforward, this one really. We've got a yellow face, his face is tucked behind the flower, but you can see this is a yellow face. Um, he's otherwise black with a red tail, there's your clue, there's your clue. It's your red-tailed bumblebee. And we know it's a male because he's got a yellow face as well. He's tucking his actual face behind the, uh, behind this, what's that, a great hyacinth by the looks. Um, but you can see the yellow around his head. So this is a red tailed bumblebee. And finally, what's this chap? He's big and fluffy. He's definitely one of the bumblebees. We did five of those tonight and this one's ginger. So this is the common carder bee. Now, there are other carder bees. There's a shrill carder bee. I don't know what gives them, whether you'll be able to tell if they're shrill from chatting to them, but um, this is the common carder bee. This is, this is a nice, easy one. Now, there are other things. I hope you enjoy the pun there. I, I put that in myself. Um, there are other things which are valuable pollinators, but they're not bees. Sometimes they look like bees, so it's important to cover a few of them, tick them off the list, off the list rather, um, an honourable mention, as they say. Wasps. Wasps absolutely deserve an honourable mention. And I know that people don't really like them. I know they're much maligned. I've worked in places before where, you know, they were really not keen on the wasps. And I still have to go around and try and uh, try and alleviate, try and mitigate some of those circumstances for the wasps. But wasps are great. Wasps are very valuable pollinators because they love sweet things. They love nectar too. You know that. Have you ever sat down with a jam sandwich or an apple or a plum or anything else sweet? I'm not going to go through all the sweet things. Um, because they, they want some of the, that sugar. So they're after the nectar as well. Now wasps, granted, don't necessarily always go in the flower. Sometimes they'll pinch the nectar from the base of the flower. That's a bit naughty, but generally they will go into the flower as well, just like the bees do. They're not after pollen here. They're after the nectar, just the nectar. But inadvertently, of course, they've got hairs all over them. They pick up pollen and transfer it from plant to plant. So these guys are valuable pollinators as well. A lot of people don't necessarily consider that with wasps. They're also really, really valuable predators. These guys, the wasps, are avid and brilliant predators of the insect world, like dragonflies, but not as cool. I really like dragonflies. It's another story for another time. Wasps are great. Wasps um, will keep down populations of all those other little insects that bug you in the summer, all the gnats and, and tiny little buzzy flies. Wasps will eat all of those things. They have a very distinct black pattern, the wasps. Um, they're not big on fluff. But they do have, as you can see, quite a lot of hair on them, but that's only if you get close enough. But really, you can see this distinct yellow and black pattern. And it's not just stripes. They've not been happy with stripes. They've gone for this wonderful sort of pointing all the way down. It's quite a fancy pattern. I think that would make a nice waistcoat, something like that. That's a lovely looking animal, that. Um, and they're less hairy than bees. We've already said that. So this, I think the wasp looks quite distinctive from the rest of the bees. Most people can, uh, can tell the difference. Um, but uh, I suppose what I really want to say is please don't hate them. They're, they're, good, they're good creatures too. Then there's the hoverflies. Now these guys look like bees and that's exactly what they're trying to do. They're crafty. They're little liars by all accounts. To use the proper term, they're what we call Batesian mimics. And Batesian mimicry um, is when one species mimics another, specifically mimicking a, a species which is more threatening or more defensive in some way than that species itself. Um, and the, the, the benefit of that is that you get um, the, same deterrent, the, the, the same deterring power 
you get that look that puts off potential predators or anyone who might otherwise disturb you without ever actually having to back it up. You don't have to go through the chemical expense of producing a sting in this case. Um, you just go around looking a little bit like a bee and people leave you alone. And it works. The hoverflies are really, really successful. They're very, very good pollinators as well because that's all they want to do. They want the same sort of life as the bees and the wasps are enjoying, just going from flower to flower, having a nice time, drinking the nectar. Our flowers are happy with that because they're pollinating all the way. But they just happen to dress up as a bee to do it and they feel the need to deceive us all. But we'll let them off. Now, these guys are members of the Diptera, a different order, not the Hymenoptera anymore. These are members of the flies, Diptera, as you might be able to tell, Diptera, they have two wings. They don't have four wings. Di to Terra wing, they have two wings. Um, interestingly, the Diptera, a little bit of a side note, the Diptera have swapped their other pair of wings. They got rid of them years ago. They said, I'm going to have an upgrade here, and they've dropped off two of their wings. And if you ever get close enough to a hoverfly, to a housefly, to a crane fly, they're members of the same order, have a little look. Behind these wings, there's little, little balls on sticks, one on each side. And that's called a halter or a halter or a halter or however you want to say it. And it's basically a little biological gyro and it enables these guys to be really, really maneuverable. You can't quite see it on this one. Um, but if you ever look at a crane fly, they're probably the best chance of looking at one of those daddy long legs. Don't swat them, don't scream, have a little look and look at those little halters, the little gyros on the back uh, behind their wings. They're great. If you're struggling to tell the difference between the hoverflies and the bees and the wasp, one of the biggest things you can look at is the eyes. If you look at any of the hymenoptera, we'll go back to the wasp, it's only got little eyes. All of them have only got quite small eyes, quite small eyes. Quite, I'm not going to go through them all. They've all got quite small eyes. When you get to the diptera, any of the flies have got quite big eyes, much bigger eyes. Often they, they may well meet in the middle as well. So that's quite, quite straightforward. Um, once you get your eye and you'll be able to see the difference in the shape of them from a distance. Um, we should have a competition, see who can do it from the furthest. So the hoverflies, the wasps, we've, we've both covered. Now, I've given you lots of information there. I appreciate that. I'm sure it won't necessarily all have gone in. Some of you may well have taken notes. I hope at the very least you've taken something from it. If you want to now put that knowledge to good use or even just to the test, to build on it, to get some field experience, you're more than welcome to come out with me. Come out and join in with our surveys in the field. We don't just do pollinators. We're doing pollinators this week. Every month we do a week of plant surveys. We do a week of pollinator surveys and a week of insect surveys. You, I'm not saying you need to come out for the whole week. Just drop in and come along to some of our surveys because they're all over the place, all across North Somerset. Uh, today we were in Nailsey looking at some wonderful wild sites uh, and the pollinators that, that are calling them home. And it is fab. It really is fantastic. They, they, it's just, just great. So that's what we're doing all through this summer. If you want to get involved, you're more than welcome to. The aim is that by the end of the summer, we will hopefully have established groups of volunteers for each of these areas to carry on some of this biodiversity monitoring, which is so crucial going forward. It's really important, as I said, because we want to know if the differences in management are having an impact on biodiversity, are boosting it as we hope they would. So the aim is that we're hoping to have little groups of volunteers in each area. And this summer is your chance to get involved and to get all the free training and field experience um, from me and from my team uh, and gain some great skills. Chuck it on your CV as well and hopefully contribute to some citizen science and have fun as well. I reckon you'll have fun. We do have a laugh. So if you want to get involved, I'll flash my references there and then I'll jump back to the details. If you want to get involved, you can email me there at nsrewilding at avonwildlifetrust.org.uk or you can go straight to avonwildlifetrust.org uk forward slash ns rewilding at north somerset rewilding or go to your search engine of choice and put in north somerset rewilding it'll turn up you'll find me somehow i'm sure you will and there's lots of events coming up there there's pollinator surveys plant surveys um insect surveys bat walks we're going to be doing some moth nights as well and so some exciting things lots of fun stuff happening all this summer and if you want to be involved by all means do get in touch come along and hopefully I'll see you over the summer. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the recording now and I'm going to go to the chat. So if anybody's got any questions, I will do my best to answer them. I'm going to stop recording and little American Maud is going to pop back in.